Okay, so let's get started. Um, so today's topic over here is to share with you guys the market outlook for 22.4. I think that's going to be something uh, very, very interesting okay, to kickstart the year, um, primarily from a macro perspective, right? So if you're trading the equities, you're trading indices, you're trading commodities, or you know, you're trading maybe more on a shorter term in terms of like the FX currency market, Okay, um, the macro outlook would give you some insights and ideas into what to look up for. Okay, uh, so today's that's what our focus is going to be. I'm going to share with you from a top down approach, okay, from a macro angle. Uh, what are some of the key events that may happen in 22.4 uh, that would definitely give you an opportunity to potentially make money from the market? Okay, um, let me, yeah, okay, so. Some housekeeping first, right, before we jump into the content. Um, for those of you who have yet to log in, uh, make sure you log into your MQ account. Okay. So how you can do it is actually on the top right. Um, there's this option for you to log in. Okay. So once you click into it, um, you just basically follow the instruction, quite straightforward, put in your username, password, etc. Uh, and then you'll be able to log in. Okay. Now, for those of you who do not have an account, then of course we'll encourage you to sign up so that you can also accumulate your MQ points, right? Because every session that you join in, if you attend the entire session, by the end of it, uh, there's some simple steps. Once you complete it, you'll be able to accumulate your MQ points. And of course, these points will then be able to exchange for some little gifts, right? So for those of you who have yet to do this, um, do take the next few minutes uh, to complete this step, right? As I continue to walk through a little bit of a housekeeping, you can actually listen to the audio and then, um, do these steps along the way. Okay. Uh, so that's one. Okay. Log into your MQ account. Okay. Uh, and I mentioned just now, right? Um, you would also receive your MQ points. So in total, you get 300, right? So the steps of this is pretty straightforward. Okay. Uh, number one, you need to open a training account with the selector advisor, um, advertiser, right? And then after that, you want to take a screenshot of this webinar, right? So any, um, slides any part of the webinar you can actually take a screenshot of this okay and then after the webinar is concluded you will receive a quiz you will need to complete the quiz and at the same time upload okay the screenshot that you have taken together with the quiz and then um, once everything is done okay you'll be able to get 300 mq points right so for those of you who want to find out a little bit more and keep yourself updated on future webinars as well there's this QR code on the right on the screen. You can scan that QR code, join to the chat. Um, and then in the future webinars, um, you'll be receiving updates as to like what's the topic, when is it, and things like this, right? Okay, so that's the, the aspect, right? So you need to actually log in, okay? Um, if you don't have an account, you need to sign up so that you can actually accumulate this 300 MQ points, okay? Now, by the end of today's session here, we also have our usual mysterious gift, okay? So if you actually pay attention throughout this session, uh, be attentive. You know, um, at the end of the session, we'll have three questions. Um, usually how it goes is we're going to flash out the questions on the screen. Uh, the first two persons who get the question, uh, sorry, the answer correct, uh, will actually win a mysterious gift, right? So in total, there will be three questions. In total, there will be six winners. So um, you need to be quick, right? You need to be fast. And in order for you to answer it quickly, um, definitely you need to pay attention in today's session, okay? So that's something to note um, by the end of this webinar, okay? Now, um, for those of you who are also fairly new to VC Plus, um, just very quick introduction about the VC Plus platform over here as well. Um, obviously, you can see the website at the bottom, okay? So you can actually go over to the website as well. To find out a little bit more about VC Plus, you can also create your free account, okay? Um, do a demo, practice a little bit on the platform, and once you're ready, you can then sign up for a live account and then put in some deposit and start trading. Okay, so the website over here you can see is www.vc-plus.com. Okay, uh, of course you could you also can see the QR code on the right top right. You can also scan that QR code um, to find out a little bit more. Okay. Now there are two current, um, I would say promotion or contest slash offer, uh, that VC plus is running at the moment. Okay. So one is what you see on the screen right now. There's the VC plus real trading contest. 
Um, and of course, this contest has already begun since last year. Uh, it's going to be all the way until 3rd of February this year, right? So there's a slight tap, typo mistake. Uh, it's 3rd of February 2024, right? So it's very straightforward. Um, you know, you still kind of have a little bit about one month period uh, to participate in this contest. All you have to do is open a VC Plus account, make a deposit, and then join the contest to win potential prizes that you can see on the left. Uh, it includes iPad, Apple Watch, and Huawei. Okay, so then if you'd like to find out a little bit more about this contest, there's this QR code that you can actually scan uh, to find out more information. Okay. Now, the other offer promotional campaign that just got started this year in 2024 uh, is this interest bonus campaign, right? So how does this work is basically, again, you register for an account in Visit Plus, you make a deposit. Okay, and um, during this entire year from January until December two to four, um, based on the five hundred minimum, right, minimum five hundred dollars deposit, um, based on your deposit itself, you'll be able to earn a total of seven percent per annum interest, right? And this is kind of paying out monthly, but of course, it's being um, factored in based on the total of seven percent per annum. Okay, so this is again um a pretty good offer, right? Um, so that at least whatever that you put in on your deposit account, um, it will not stay stagnant, right? Even if you don't use it for trading, uh, potentially you can gain some interest out of the deposit that you put it into your account. Okay, so these are the two offers. Okay, lastly, uh, if you'd like to find out more information and keep yourself updated in terms of any new offers and campaigns that's coming out from VC Plus, feel free to scan this QR code on the right. Okay, and uh, you then be added into the channel, and um, from there you receive updates throughout. Okay, so very quickly, um, these are some of the housekeepings um, to share with you, uh, and of course, quick disclaimer over here: um, the information that I'm going to present to you today uh, is solely based on my personal take. It doesn't directly constitute to any form of um, advisory or you know trading signals and things like that. Okay, and of course. Trading and investing involve risk, so you can make sure you're aware of those. Okay, so with all those housekeeping done, um, we'll jump into the content for today. So I'm gonna share with you what I've prepared. Okay, and uh, we do have a little bit of a Q and A at the end of the session as well. So throughout this session, if you have any questions uh, that you would like to clarify, okay, do write it down first. Uh, and then during the Q and A session, you can actually post it into the chat. Uh, I'll be able to take a look at those questions and answer them accordingly. Okay. So today's session here will be covering mainly um the macro outlook for twenty two four, right? As I mentioned, some of the key major trends or events, uh, to take note of. Okay. And uh, after that, you know, we can also jump into the charts to look at some of the analysis, um, giving you some ideas in terms of what you can look into. Okay. So let me go straight into the outlook over here, right? Um, I think this year in 22.4, um, if you have been following the market since last year, coming into this year, uh, I think some of this may not be foreign to you. Okay, You might also have some you know, insights on uh, the pointers that I put in over here. Okay. So for me, I think the, the main primary focus for this year um, would be the definitely the Fed monetary policy. Okay. Um, Bank of Japan would be something very interesting as well. Uh, I think the Fed monetary policy, there's a very good possibility we're going to see the rate cut. Uh, but for Bank of Japan, it's pretty interesting because we may or may not, okay. But if the Bank of Japan is going to shift their monetary policy, it's going to be very interesting as well in this year. Okay. It's going to potentially shift some of the market and risk environment in, in the financial uh, mar market itself. Okay, then um, there's also the de-dollarization um, ongoing, right? Um, with last year, BRICS uh, conglomerate forming and things like that. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about that um, as I progress. Uh, then precious metal, I believe that precious metal is naturally going to be one of the top performing commodity in 2024. Okay, and lastly here, uh, we have the we have the Bitcoin halving, right? So Bitcoin halving, uh, if you're into the crypto environment, crypto space, uh, this is going to be very exciting as well because historically the halving tends to happen every four years, and twenty two four April is the next halving, right? Okay, 
Um, so I'm going to talk, go into details a little bit on all of this here. Okay. Um, so the first thing here, let's talk about the Fed monetary policy, right? Um, just very quickly from 22.3 to 22.4, right? 22.3, the focus was very much from the Fed side is to tackle inflation, okay? And to bring inflation down, which I believe the Fed has successfully done that, okay? So it has hiked interest rate very aggressively in 22.2, 22.3, uh, bringing interest rate all the way to its 5.5%, right? And this year, 22.4, um, we're starting to pivot into the Fed talking about cutting rates. Okay, and then there's this conversation about, oh, will that be going to be a recession and things like that. Um, from the recent economic data, I don't think we're going to see a major recession. Okay, because the overall economic data seems to be quite resilient, quite strong in the US. Uh, but will we see a cut in rates? Very likely. Okay, the question is more of, will the Fed cut interest rate in March or in June? or maybe in the second half of 22.4. There's a very good possibility the Fed will cut. It's just a matter of when and how aggressive. Now, looking at the recent economic data with the economy being quite resilient, there is no pressure for the Fed to cut it very aggressively. So it's going to cut, but it's probably going to cut progressively, right? Slowly, okay? So how does that going to impact the financial market? Um, similar to course, the Fed itself is talking about the dollar, right? Dollar itself is like the global reserve currency right now. Um, everything that we're trading revolves around the dollar at this moment. Uh, the Fed monetary policy is going to impact global assets, okay? So I'm going to dive deeper into liquidity, macro liquidity in a while. But over here, just want you to understand that uh, the overall direction that I'm anticipating is the Fed would likely cut rates, okay? So when it cut rates, it's going to have an impact in stocks. It's going to have impact in the commodity space. It's going to have an impact in the currency market because, um, again, if you understand simple uh, relationship, if interest rates are falling, the dollar would drop in value, right? And um, overall, that has an impact in the financial market, okay? Now, the second part here is the Bank of Japan monetary policy, right? So if you have been following the development of Bank of Japan, um, it has not really changed its policy for the last two years, right? Where every bank has been very aggressively increasing rates. Uh, bank of Japan has maintained its easing policy, right? In fact, it has been holding on to its YCC uh, policy, right? New curve control. Uh, and that's where we saw last year, you know, the yen actually weakened significantly across the board. Um, now, going forward at one point in time, whether is it going to be this year? or not, or maybe next year, the Bank of Japan needs to slowly abandon its YCC policy, right? Because um, maintaining a negative interest rate environment, maintaining an easing tough policy uh, will not be sustainable in a long period of time, right? At one point in time, it's going to abandon that and then we're going to pivot into tightening. So when that actually shifts, uh, there will be a significant impact in the global uh, financial market because right now the yen is cheap in terms of interest okay what i mean by that is today if you want to you know from a global scale if you want to do foreign investing and things like that uh, people would actually tend to borrow the yen because the interest is so low and then reinvest it somewhere else right so we have this term called carry trade we basically borrow money from one currency um, and then we reinvest it in another because the interest is so low right but when that starts to change Right when imagine in a global scale, a lot of people, a lot of companies, banks are doing that. Right, they're basically borrowing the yen to do something else. Uh, but imagine when the Bank of Japan starts to increase rates. Right, your interest will continue to follow increasing. Okay, and when that happens, there's a global shift because everyone would now need to consider: Do I still want to hold on to the yen? Maybe I'll need to right clearly uh, refinance the entire part of it um, and relook at the entire structure. Okay, so when that happens, there's going to be a global phenomenon shift. Um, and that's going to impact risk environment, right? Because that's going to create a lot of market uncertainty. Um, and that's something to know. Okay, so whether this is going to happen this year or next year, I think it's important that you want to keep an eye on the possibility of this happening within 22.4. Okay, um, so that's one thing to note. 
Okay, then we have the conversation about de-dollarization, right? So I see um, some of you asking questions related to like Fed money policy and de-dollarization. Um, I'm going to split this two quite distinctly, right? Because the Fed monetary policy is something that is cyclical. Okay, so if you understand economy, we have like recession, we have um, inflation, then, you know, it follows suit a cycle, right? And then the Fed monetary policy would be in a cycle as well, cutting rates, increasing rate, cutting rates, increasing rates. Okay? Uh, but de-dollarization is something that um, it will take time, but eventually it will happen okay um people whenever people most people hear about de-dollarization their first impression is well it's going to be very very scary um it's not something that's going to happen overnight right so to me i don't think that's something very scary because you can actually prep for it you can prepare for it okay so what i mean by de-dollarization over here is that right now a lot of trades a lot of foreign investing, um, foreign investments uh, are hinging on the US dollar, right? Um, today, if you want to trade commodities, people would likely trade in the dollar, okay? Today, you're talking about what is the safest currency. People will talk about the dollar, right? So the dollar is like one of the safest asset, okay? However, uh, it's starting to lose its significance globally, okay? Uh, and of course, people wouldn't want, you know, the dollar to continue having heavy dominance, right? Because if the dollar continues to be like the, the heavy dominance globally, then everyone will need to quote unquote bound down to the US, right? Because whatever the US do or whatever the US say, they will need to follow, okay? In a way, because they, they still hold that strong currency, right? But as this continue to shift, right, countries would want de-dollarization to take place because they don't want the US to continue dominating globally. Hey, nobody wants that, right? Everyone wants to have certain control and say over it. Um, and we are starting to see campaigns coming in, right? So just now I mentioned the, the conglomerate on BRICS, okay? So this is a little bit into the, the whole idea of petrol dollar, right? So um, up to last year, a lot of trades that's happening in the in the petroleum energy space um, are all traded with dollar, right? So today, if you want to buy petrol, you want to buy energy, you want to buy um, oil, you need to trade it with the dollar, right? It's always priced mostly based on the USD, okay? Um, however, starting last year, there's this conglomerate, you know, this kind of quote-unquote community that comes together with different countries forming what we call a BRICS community, right? So it... it I can't recall um, what's the full name, but basically it's a few countries coming together uh, and they start to come up with a kind of like a, a agreement, right? An agreement that says that, all right, right now, since, you know, you also produce commodity, I also produce commodity, uh, we can actually do a butter trade in a way, right? Within our community here, within the BRICS community, right? And we don't need to deal with the dollar, okay? So when that starts to happen, you realize that, oh, now... I can actually do international trade without touching the dollar, right? So that's where it starts to lose that dominance, right? So as the years goes by, eventually it will happen, okay? Now, de-dollarization doesn't mean that the dollar is going to go to zero. It just means that it's going to lose its dominance. And when it loses dominance, there's less demand. The valuation of the dollar would drop. So think of it like in the past, GBP is one of the very dominant currency, okay, historically. Uh, and then before the US comes in, that's the Great Britain pound, right? And then after that, the US took over and then the US becomes a global reserve currency. The pound is still there. It's just that it has lost its value from a global scheme, okay? So de-dollarization is something to take note as well because as we continue to see this develop, uh, the valuation of the dollar is going to drop and based on money flow, okay, if a value of an asset is going to drop, the demand is going to drop, money is going to get out from the asset and it needs to go somewhere else, okay? So that's where you want to also study if today the dollar is going to drop in value over time, 
where will this money flow into? Is it going to go into precious metal? Is it going to go into crypto? Is it going to go into stocks? Is it going to go into another asset, right? So that's the study of money flow, all right? So keep an eye on de-dollarization conversation that's happening globally within 22 for as well, okay? And then, of course, that would tie in quite nicely to precious metal, right? So for me, um, de-dollarization and precious metal, they're kind of correlated in, 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 a, in, in this conversation, okay? Because from my perspective right now, if you take a look at global assets, um, we're not going to touch on crypto for now, okay? But global asset, aside from the dollar being a safe haven, um, there's really nothing much except for go okay or what we call precious metal right so if you are tracking on the development of gold okay um since 22 to 22 3 a lot of central banks are already buying up and storing gold okay it's not because you know suddenly they decide oh i like gold right but a lot of all the central banks are already starting to see the possibility of de-dollarization happening okay and at the moment, that is like no second option, right? Other than gold, what would you bank on, right? There's nothing that is as certain, as safe as putting your money in gold, okay? So as the years goes by, right, in 224, 225, 226, um, there's a very good chance and possibility that precious metals like gold is continue going to hit all-time high, right? So... We are not talking about, oh, every day the gold price is going to rally, right? But we're talking about from a macro scheme of things in 22.4, 22.5, 22.6. There's a very good possibility gold is going to keep breaking new highs, okay? So from an investing point of view, you can start to position yourself from that angle, right? As de-dollarization takes place, what would likely increase in value in the highest probability, it will be naturally the precious metal, okay? So that's something to note um you know preparing going into 22 fall right uh, and then we have the bitcoin halving okay so bitcoin halving is going to happen this year in april the previous halving that took place was back in 2020 uh somewhere around april as well okay and if you study back in 2020 after the halving take place um prices of bitcoin actually skyrocketed okay it went up a lot okay so based on that if you look into the possibility of this year right after april um where would the price of bitcoin likely go after the halving uh, there's a good chance it's, it's likely gonna go up right <laughs> uh the understanding of halving again for those of you who are fairly new to this term uh is basically it's now slightly more difficult for you to mine a bitcoin right so just give you some example in in a number perspective okay if let's say uh before the halving you need maybe one day to mine maybe one unit of coin, okay? After the halving, in one day, that means the same period of time, you can only mine maybe 0.5%, right? Half of it, okay? So it's actually more difficult to mine, right? And therefore, if you take a look at the demand and supply equation, supply is going to drop by half, okay? And that's where, um, if you understand demand and supply, um, naturally, prices would then shoot up, okay? So um, that's something to note, all right? Um, if you're fairly new to crypto, then you know now would be also a good time to study a little bit into the crypto market, you know. And if you want to leverage and capitalize on the upcoming Bitcoin halving, okay, that will happen around April, right? So you still have some time to actually prep up for that, okay? Uh, yeah, so I see some questions re regarding to Bitcoin halving, right? Um, you know, what historical patterns or trends should investors be aware? Um, how might it affect the broader cryptocurrency market? I think I can't cover that, right? So back in 2020, when that happened, um, the Bitcoin market actually skyrocketed, okay? Um, let me just maybe very, very quickly uh, bring up a chart over here. Okay, um just to show you historically what happened, right? Okay, so the last halving here is back in 2020. I mean, this is a monthly chart, right? I mean, uh, if, if I don't want, I can go down to the weekly as well to just show you what happened in 2020, okay? So this is what happened in 2020, um, April, summer April is where the halving take place. And then you can see the price actually skyrocketed, right? Okay, 
So this year, um, somewhere in April is where the halving is going to happen, right? Will it skyrocket and retest that previous peak around 60,000? Maybe. Okay, of course, nothing is going to be certain. Um, but if, you know, historically, what's what has happened is going to repeat itself, uh, then there's a good chance you may actually capitalize on this upside. All right. Uh, so that's the overall um, outlook that you want to pay attention to. Okay, so let me dive a little bit into macro liquidity, okay? Because I think this is going to be um, one of the driving factors this year itself, right? And I also see some questions relating back to, you know, um, would the Fed use monetary policy? Uh, how would it impact, you know, the markets and things like that? Um, yeah, so understanding macro liquidity will give you the answer it. Okay. Now, liquidity over here, we're not talking about your, your day to day trading liquidity, right? Because that's like the micro perspective, right? Uh, that's the that's the market liquidity, right? We're talking this liquidity here, we're talking about global scale, right? Um, so don't confuse yourself with the principle of liquidity, okay? Um, when you're talking about minor trading liquidity, micro liquidity, we're talking about, you know, um, if the market is uh, I mean, if the participant in the market is small today or, you know, it's a bank holiday, then liquidity is low, right? Um, this macro liquidity we are referring is not that liquidity, okay? So don't confuse that two terms, okay? Um, the macro liquidity we are talking about here is talking about the global um, central banks right now is, is the Fed, right? So we are definitely focusing on the Fed, okay? Uh, we're talking about how the Fed monetary policy is going to impact global liquidity. Okay, that's what we're referring to. Okay. So before we jump into that, uh, in terms of the impact and the influences on liquidity, uh, you need to first understand the function of the Federal Reserve. Okay, so the Federal Reserve basically uses monetary policy to drive economy towards two main objectives. Right, one is price stability; the other is maximum employment. Uh, this shouldn't be new to most of you, okay? But uh, price stability basically refers to inflation, okay? Maximum employment refers to economic development, right? Because if people are unemployed, recession is high, um, it's not good. They want to bring it up, right? So they need to ensure employment is there, right? People can work. Uh, price stability means that you don't want inflation to take place because if inflation is not controlled, then um, all your prices will be haywire, right? So the Fed uses monetary policy to kind of control these two things, right? They are kind of like the objective, right? So you can see when inflation is high, they're going to increase rates to bring it down. Uh, when there's a fear of a recession, they're going to cut rates to increase economic activity, right? Things like that, okay? So that's the baseline, right? And how would interest rate impact the entire global markets? Um, then we need to understand how interest rates affect credit okay now when we talk about credit over here it's actually quite similar to the principle and the concept of like your credit card right so credit is basically a loan right you can understand it in a layman term it's like a loan okay uh, but loan here we are talking about major scale loan right we're not talking about your personal loan and things like that no, we're talking about businesses borrowing money we're talking about big huge corporation borrowing money right and when we're talking about corporations and businesses borrowing money it's not a small amount okay so what will impact businesses whether to take up the credit whether to take up loan aggressively or very cautiously it boils down to the interest right because if today the global interest is very low, then it makes a lot of sense to borrow more to expand your businesses, right? Aggressively. So the relationship relationship starts to kick in, right? When interest rate goes up, loan becomes more expensive, credit becomes more expensive, money becomes more expensive. Um, the demand for loan, the demand for credit slows down. Okay, and then the opposite is true, right? If interest rate is very cheap, you know, people will borrow more money, right? Just now I mentioned about Bank of Japan in an easing policy and a lot of corporations, a lot of foreign investors will borrow the yen to do something else, right? And that's exactly what's happening, okay? Uh, so the yen itself is, is just one aspect, right? But globally, the dollar has more dominance right now and therefore the Fed is still the priority, okay? 
So there are some ways to gauge liquidity, right? Um, so before I jump into that, um, very quickly to share with you a little bit, the relationship of how this is going to impact financial market first. Okay. Uh, during a low interest rate environment, when credit is cheap, okay, put yourself in the shoes of all these investors, right? If today, you know, you can borrow money from the bank at almost close to zero interest, what would you do? Okay, you would likely, on a smaller scale, just borrow some money, put into the financial markets, in the equities market, right? S&P, for example. And if the S&P can give you an average of 5% per year with the interest being close to zero, then you net-net actually make money out of that, right? You don't need to do anything. You basically borrow, put into the equities market. Next year, you take it out, you earn, you earn 5%. If the interest is very low, close to 1%, you just pay off the interest. Net-net, you make about 4%. Right? So you have that kind of perspective right, from the market itself. So when we have a low interest rate environment, liquidity is going to increase because a lot of people will go to the bank, borrow money, and then this money is cheap. They'll start to take it out and then start to use it or invest in the market. right? So that's that, that relationship ongoing. Okay? If interest rate is low, generally you start to see equities market tend to perform a little bit better. Okay? When interest rate is high, um, usually the equities market will come down. Okay. So actually, if you start to observe the S&P, right, um, back during in COVID years, okay, what did the bank do? The bank cut rates. What did the equities prices react? Go up, okay? It doesn't tie into the economy, right? Because back then, the economy is bad, but equities are still going up. Okay, a lot of people don't really understand their relationship. They say like, why, why the economy is bad? How come the equities are going up? Because economy doesn't tie into the, to the equities market, right? What move prices is not your economy. What move prices is the money flow, right? So looking back again, you know, during high interest rate environment back in um, early 2022, going to 2023, what happened in the equities market? The equities market came down, okay? It's post-COVID, why did it came down, right? It's not because of the economy, but it's because interest rate is rising, okay? Then if you take a look like second, uh, almost second half of Q4 of last year, how come equity suddenly boom? Because the conversation has started to pivot, right? From high interest rate environment, we are already pivoted into the Fed cutting rates, right? The question is when, right? And that's where you start to see equities booming again, okay? So if you take a look at um, this year, as the Fed continues to develop the conversation about cutting rates, um, there's a very high good chance that S&P, NASDAQ, Dow Jones for 22.4 is going to see all-time high. All right? So that's the macro understanding from liquidity. Right? So how do we gauge liquidity? Um, there are a couple of indicators that I'm sharing with you over here. Okay? Um, there is a long-term liquidity and then there's a shorter term, right? So these three indicators that you see is more of a long-term liquidity, right? So we look at unemployment rate, moving averages crossover, right? We look at ANFCI, which is the Adjusted National Financial Conditions Index, uh, which again, I have also some links over there you can refer to. Basically, they are from FRED, okay? Uh, then we also look at the LEI, right? Leading Economic Index, okay? Now, very, very quickly, just share with you this um, spreadsheet that I put together to understand a little bit of macro. Okay. So unemployment rate, of course, right now is below average. Right? I mean, if you want, you can go and chart it out. But um, you know, I think quite straightforward. Just look at the, 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 the development of unemployment rate is actually quite low. Okay, so it's below average. Okay. Uh, and then just like I mentioned, you know, some of these indicators are from Fred, right? So if you go over to the website, this is what you see. Okay. Um, usually I'll just look at the five years data, right? And you can see this data is basically coming down, right? So if this is coming down, we'll just put falling. And of course, it's below zero. That gives me two points on liquidity, right? The higher the point in liquidity, the better it is, okay, uh, in terms of equities, okay? And then the other one is LEI, right? So very, very straightforward, right? You just go over to the website. Uh, for LEI, it's basically from the conference board. You scroll down a little bit, okay? Uh, and then over here, we have this chart, right? Okay, so... As of this chart right now, you can see um, we are going, we are coming, we are coming down, but we're starting to go back up a little bit, right? Okay, so you can see here change um, percentage year on year on LEI, uh, starting to flatten and potentially starts to U-turn. Okay, so of course this is a little bit um, 
early stage, right? You can put it under rising if you're expecting it to continue to bounce. You can still put it as falling because we really haven't confirmed that. So this one here, you know, it's not a hard and fast rule. Okay, so for me, I'll put it a little bit of rising because it's starting to show sign of a bounce, right? Okay, uh, so that's that tree first. Okay, so very, very quickly, you can reference to those. Okay, then on a shorter term indicator to measure macro liquidity, we have this tree, right? Um, BAA, okay, which is your corporate bond yield um, curve. Again, if you understand a little bit of all these indicators, I think you just go over the website or just do a simple Google search to understand that, right? We're not going to go into an economic class today. <laughs> um, the other indicator we look into is the non-financial leverage. Okay. And the last one here is the CCC spread. Okay. So very, very quickly again, um, you know, I'll just bring you to the website and just show you how to keep track of things. Okay. This is the BAA bond yield. You look at the five years, what does it do? It's coming down, right? I mean, it's rising, rising, rising. And then right now it's coming down. So over here, what we do, we put falling. Okay. And then the other one is the non-financial leverage, right? Same thing over here. You go over to the website, click on the five years, it's going up. Okay. But it's still below zero, right? But it's rising below zero, right? So it's rising below zero. The last indicator is the CCC spread, right? Um, let's take a look at what's happening. Okay. One year is going up, right? It's going up. So over here is rising. Okay. So if it's falling, then of course it's better in liquidity, but right now it's still rising. So if you take a look at this, we, we do a simple summation. Okay, some indicators are tight in liquidity. Some indicators are easing in liquidity. So net net, we get a three point. Okay, three point is a good um, liquidity environment, right? So in other words, it's actually positive for equities. Okay, uh, the middle is zero. Obviously, the max is eight. Then the worst is negative eight. Right, we're never gonna get eight and negative eight, right? Because it's never going to be an extreme, okay? But anything in the green zone is basically good for equities, which means the macro liquidity is pretty cheap, right? Cheap money is flowing around in the world, right? So this is this recently updated for now, right? Today, we can't update it, right? Um, again, I don't really need to track this manually because by understanding the general direction of the Fed, um, you have an idea, right? Uh, so this is more like giving you a very mechanical way of tracking, okay? And uh, I've been using this, tracking it, um, using this to this model to share with a lot of traders and investors since COVID times. Uh, the model has never failed, okay? During COVID times where everyone's panicked, the liquidity model is giving us three points, five points. You just buy at every dip, okay? At least from a longer term perspective, you just buy at every dip. Eventually, you make money out of it, right? Um, and then in 22.1, 22.2, macro liquidity is telling us be careful, be careful because it's in the red zone, right? It's from green turning to yellow, turning to red. Um, that's where you don't want to be aggressively buying, okay? And uh, what we saw in 22.1, 22.2 is where the equities market starts to do a big uh, kind of retracement, big pullback, right? So this year, uh, the model is telling us that you know, likelihood of equities going higher is very, very significant, very high. Um, and that's where you want to then pay attention to upside, right? In the equity side of things. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, so that's the liquidity aspect of things. Okay. So just now I cover quite a bit of things, right? Um, I think this is kind of like reinforcing what I've just mentioned, right? Uh, stock market movement and economy is two different things, right? So stock market is strong when liquidity is flush, which means cheap money, right? As I, if I explain it, illustrated. Okay. And then the opposite is true, right? Uh, when the economy starts to heat up a lot, there's an inflation concern, the Fed would start to do tightening and then liquidity is going to drop, equities market is going to drop. Okay. So that's pretty straightforward. Okay. So uh, with that said, uh, you know, We'll start off with the equities first, right? So S&P and the NASDAQ 100. Okay, let me go back to this chart over here. Okay, so if you take a look at, um, let me take the S&P 500. Okay, um, of course, if you take a look from a day-to-day -day chart, um, we're kind of testing its, okay, the data is probably still loading, right? Okay, if I'm not mistaken, this is um near. Let me just double check with it, right? Just double check. Okay, 
Okay. Uh, the previous high is somewhere around four eight twenty. Okay. Um, yeah, I think the data here haven't really shown it. Okay. Uh, but we're basically S and P has yet to break an all time high, but there's a very good possibility we're gonna break its all time high. Okay. So the previous all time high is actually somewhere around four eight twenty, which is very very close. Um, obviously the market is not gonna keep going up 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 and up. All right. So what you want to pay attention to is uh, eventually at some point in time, it's going to give you a deeper pullback. Okay. But understanding macro liquidity, okay, what you want to be doing is not to be selling the pullback, but wait for the pullback and then look for entry to buy it up. Okay. And there's a very good chance we're going to break this all time high in the year itself in 224. Okay. That's a very high possibility. I'm not guaranteeing anything, but there's a very high possibility that's going to happen. Okay. So I would say whether you're looking at S&P, whether you're looking at NASDAQ, whether you're looking at Dow Jones, um, any pullback will give you the opportunity to look for the buy. Okay, I think quite quite straightforward. Okay, um, just now we take a look at Bitcoin, right? So kind of share with you the charts on Bitcoin as well already. Okay, um, so again, historically, halving tends to, to, to push higher, right? So same thing over here, I think Bitcoin, um, with the recent news development of you know over whether the ETF is going to get accepted and things like that or not. Um, there will be short term volatility, but if you want to look at a bigger picture perspective, okay, uh, the halving is taking place somewhere around April, okay. So from now to April, many things can develop, right? Um, it can be very volatile, it can be you know just doing sideways, whatever it is. But I think going into April, getting close towards April, maybe the last two weeks of March, okay. Um, you want to be looking out for buy opportunity, okay? Um, of course, right now it's a little bit too early because the market can do a lot of things going into end of March. But as we approach end of March, right, um, you want to look out for buy opportunity. Of course, you can always do a prep work, right? Like right now you can actually start prepping, you know, where will be some of the areas that you want to pay attention to, right? So you can see it just very, very quickly highlighting some key zones. Um, suppose the market going into... April, okay, starts to do a pullback here. You can look to buy your first position. You know, if it continues to pull back deeper, you can look to buy a second position. And then ideally going into April, we start to see that rally back up, right? Okay, so some prep work um, that you can start doing right now. Okay, so that's on the Bitcoin side of things, right? Uh, I'll skip through the dollar Mexican chart first. We'll talk about the commodities, right? Okay, the commodities over here. Um, so the first one is gold. Okay, let's talk about gold first. Okay, now gold on the daily scale, okay, is doing a little bit of pullback. Um, its all-time high is basically here. Um, kind of had a little bit of a break, but haven't really convincingly break any um, and maintain above that high, right? You can see here. Uh, but I would say there's a very good possibility we're going to break above it within this year, okay? But of course, the market is not even gonna go up, up, up every day, as I mentioned, right? So I would say any form of pullback in gold, okay, maybe back towards the zone, okay, around close to 20, uh, sorry, 2000 area, uh, would potentially also be a buy possibility to look for more upside, okay? So you need to be aware, um, what is your time horizon as well, right? Because today's topic here, we're sharing more of a bigger scale, okay? More of a bigger time frame perspective, um, from a year to year kind of outlook, right? Uh, internally, uh, there will be pullbacks, there will be rallies, there will be drops. Uh, you need to then be aware of that, right? So don't have the impression that, oh, today, you know, because we talk about buying gold and you just buy now, right? It doesn't, it doesn't mean like that. Okay. You still need to have your proper entry technique and strategies to get involved in it, right? But I think overall, um, there's a good chance we'll break that high. Okay. So what this means to you is um, any dip in the long run, you want to look for a buy trade opportunity and um, you probably don't want to exit everything at the high here. You want to leave some of your position to just trail it as far as the market gives you. Okay. Um, this is going to be the same thing for silver. Okay. Um, silver over here together with gold, there's a good chance we're going to see all time high, right? Silver has yet to really break its all-time high, okay? Silver is doing a little bit of a different pattern, okay? 
Uh, but there's a very good possibility silver will basically follow gold. And it's going to break that, maybe do a little bit of pullback, and then continue to retest its all-time high. Okay. So precious metal, whether it's in gold or silver, uh, there's a very good chance you're going to see more upside. Okay. Um, let me just see if I can do this here. Uh, I don't think I can do it here, but okay. The other thing you can look out for, um, you can see in the slides that I have over here, is you can actually compare the ratio. Oops. Okay, I think that's an image. Okay. Um, what you can also look into is to compare the ratio of XAU against XAG. Okay. Now, what does this ratio gives you? Is basically telling you in the near term whether the gold price is going to be relatively stronger than silver or silver is going to be relatively stronger than gold, okay? So that's actually more um, useful if you're doing more of a short-term trading decision, right? Do you want to buy gold? Do you want to buy silver? Which one will give you a better profit? Um, you can look at the gold-silver ratio, okay? Um, but generally, the direction of precious metal is going to be up, right? Uh, then we have the dollar-yen, right? So very, very quickly, let me jump over to the chart on the dollar-yen. Oops. Okay. Dollar yen. Uh, so dollar yen here is where the focus would be very much on the dollar plus the Bank of Japan. Okay. So as I mentioned, um, the Bank of Japan may start to pivot, right? And when that pivots, um, because they are already almost like negative rate zero, they cannot go any way lower. So the only direction that the Bank of Japan can pivot into is to go into tightening. Okay. So when that happens, um, what do you think the yen is going to happen, right? Because economically, if you're going to do a tightening policy, the currency would strengthen. Okay? I mean, it's not, go it's not going to be so straightforward, but generally, that's the relationship, right? So if the yen is going to strengthen, then of course, dollar yen is likely going to go down, right? And then another conversation that we had is the dollar, right? De-dollarization, the value of the dollar is going to go down. The Fed cutting rates, the dollar is going to go down, okay? So if you're talking about dollar yen, that's probably multiple factors that can potentially push the dollar yen to the downside okay so from a technical point of view right you can see that uh the market has actually reacted off a very nice little double top okay and look at where the neckline is one two eight area right so from where we are right now to potentially the previous neckline is a huge profit potential that may be able to capitalize within this this year itself okay so that's the focus on the dollar yen um, angle, okay? Now, very quickly, um, I'll cover, okay, the dollar Mexican, okay? Uh, this is a little bit the, not the common pair, okay? Um, but again, if you take a look at this chart here, oh, let me go on a higher time frame. Okay, we, we, we don't have that historical data. Uh, let me just cross-check here first, yeah? Just to make sure the things I'm covering is accurate. Okay, uh, we're missing a little bit of the data here, but let me just point out um, that area, okay? The area is somewhere around 1450. Okay, 1450, somewhere there. Okay, somewhere there, okay? Uh, there's some key area support resistance in the past around 1450, right? And right now we're trading around $16. And of course, um, from a weekly scale, we can see that there's this minor low, okay? So for dollar Mexican, the, the backdrop of this, right, is going to be um, number one, the dollar itself, and number two is the Mexican peso, right? Uh, there is some, I mean, the news doesn't really report a lot of all these things, but you're kind of keeping track on Mexican for, you know, since 22.1 towards this year, going into 22.4. Uh, there's a lot of development taking place in the Mexican place, pace, right? Um, So one of the play you can look into is, of course, the Mexican currency, right? Mexican peso. So we are looking at potentially looking uh, for downside. Okay. Uh, and of course, the nice thing about dollar Mexican sell trade is your... Uh, interest, your swap fee is going to be super positive, right? You're going to collect interest from this trade to the downside anyway, okay? 
So do look up for this if you're interested. It's a little bit more on an exotic pair. Um, the target here we're looking is around $14, um, 14.55, right? So we kind of have an ample room for us to drop, um, not only profiting from the price movement, but also profiting potentially from the swap, okay? Now, if you're interested in um, the Mexican market itself, I'm not sure if I have a chart on this here. Okay, we don't... Uh, Never mind. So I'll just share with you the, the asset itself, okay, um, that you can look into if you're interested in, okay, uh, it's called EWW, it's basically your Mexican ETF, okay, um, so that's something you can look into as well if you're interested in the Mexican market, right. Um, so this one here, uh, the play is, the dollar Mexican play is really looking at the dollar devaluing at the same time, the Mexican market may be picking up steam, right? So that's where we look into that, okay? Uh, so I think these are some of the major uh, macro outlook that you want to pay attention to um, for the year of 22-4, yeah? So uh, I think a couple of questions here probably have been addressed along the way. Uh, I just see one uh, questions, you know, talking about China or Hang Seng market has been moving down recently is there any possibility of a u-turn this year um i'm not very optimistic in the china and the hong kong market right i've been sharing this um a couple of times talking about how uh, this two market is something that you don't want to be long-term investing in it right you, you can trade it from a day-to-day week-to-week basis because you know just basically trading price you can trade anything um but from an investing point of view, it just doesn't look good, okay? Uh, looking at the price development here, there's a good chance we'll see a little bit more downside for Hang Seng, potentially all the way down to its previous low, okay? Uh, there's no sign of any bounce at the moment, okay? So you want to keep an eye on around maybe 15,000 for Hang Seng, okay? Uh, and then in terms of the... 850. Okay, uh, do we have the A50? Okay, we don't. Let me just make sure. Okay, we, we don't have the A50. So let me just cross check and make sure the price level and give it to you. Okay. Okay, so for A50, the price point here is about 10,000, um, around 10,200 area, right? So Hang Seng here, we are looking at, okay, sorry, just go back to the daily. Okay, so Hang Seng here, we're looking around this low, okay, which is about 15,000, okay, um, for A50, Okay, uh, we are looking at key areas somewhere around 10,200. Okay, so I think there's uh, a little bit more downside of both index. Okay, um, so just be very cautious if you're kind of investing into it. I think the easier equities index to be investing in um, naturally is going to be on uh, the US market. Okay, just simply based on the macro liquidity topic to recover. It's going to be easier in the U.S. Okay. So good. Uh, with that, um, I'll jump over to the mysterious gift section. Okay. So what we're going to be doing here is I'm going to flash out the question. Uh, and you need to get the answer correct, right? And the first two person that type in the correct answer in the chat, uh, we'll be able to win this mysterious gift. And what you need to do is you need to fill out a Google form, right? Um, so the moderator later will also post up the, the links and then just fill up. Okay. Now you don't need to type the entire sentence. You just need to type whether the answer is A, B, or C. Okay. So very quickly, this is the first question. What is the primary objective of the Fed's monetary policy in driving the the economy, right? A, maximizing inflation, B, achieving price stability and maximum employment, and C, boosting the stock market, okay? Um, yeah, so I think this one quite straightforward, right? The answer is actually B, achieving 
price stability and maximum employment, right? So I think over here, um, first two person that got it correct and um, would be Yuk Long and Hui Pin. Okay, Yuk Long and Hui Pin, right? So uh, you need to fill up a Google form, okay? So that uh, MQ Trader over here, MQ Dami is able to then send over the gifts uh, to you, right? Okay, so you can see in the chat, um, just copy the link and then complete the Google form. Okay, quick one, second question. What happens when interest rate goes up according to the discussion on macro liquidity? A, demand for credit increase. B, credit becomes more expensive and harder to attain. Um, C, stock market experiences a bull run. Okay. So what happens when interest rate goes up, right? Based on what we have covered today on the topic on macro liquidity. Okay. So some of you are saying B, 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 A, right? So the correct answer is B, right? So credit becomes more expensive because interest rate means, you know, you need to pay higher loan interest and things like that. So credit is more expensive. Um, and of course the side effect, right? The follow through effect of that is um, equities market tends to go down. So great, um, seven, 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 and uh, Ahmad Tajudin, uh, congrats on winning this, okay? Third question, in the context of liquidity, when the market, when is the stock market considered a strong and bull run, okay? Um, A, during an economic recession, B, when the Fed is tightening its monetary policy, and C, in a slow growth environment where the Fed is stimulating economy. Okay, so this kind of ties in into liquidity as well, right? Just like we mentioned, during certain period of time, the equities tends to go up, right? Um, and then we can kind of share with you some data to track as well, okay? So the answer over here is C, okay? When the Fed is actually stimulating economy, which means AKA the Fed is cutting rates, um, it's in the easing policy, that's usually when the stock market will consider it to be strong, okay? So, um, for some of you who already win it before, I think um, you won't be able to win two prizes in the same session, okay? Uh, so I think over here, um, 777 Yuk Long and uh, Tan Yujie has already won the previous two session, right? So uh, Sai Hong and Caterpie here would be the winning um, ones for question three, okay? So congrats for everyone. Um, but of course, you know, even if you didn't get this, um, mysterious gift but i think um the main takeaway from today's session is hopefully give you an idea of you know the the macro liquidity principle um plus okay um sharing with you some insights into what i'm looking at in 22.4 hopefully give you some ideas and you know trade opportunities that you can work on um for for the year right or at least for the first quarter of this year itself okay so that's all for me for today's session. Um, I do hope that you take away something from the webinar itself. Okay, and all the best for your trading and investing for the year of 22 4. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys in the next webinar, right? Okay, good. Uh, so I will. Okay, I'll end off the webinar over here. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. Okay, so see you guys. Bye bye. Thanks for watching.